So senescent cells, they, they release SAS, right? And it's, it's always going to be kind of systemic. So if you have senescent cells in one place, we're, we're pretty sure that they would then spread out kind of throughout the body. Well, not all senescent cells have a SAS. So there, uh, yeah. it's 30 to 70% in, at least in culture, in our preliminary experiments that need, you know, we, we are in the process of publishing. And other people have noticed that it's around that percent. So not every senescent cell has a SASP that we could probably define as being senescent. So it depends how you define senescence. It comes down to that to some extent. But if we're looking for things like what we call telomer-associated DNA damage foci, so these are areas of um, DNA damage within the ends of chromosomes, that's a pretty good assay. It's not perfect. It's pretty good. But we do find that there are senescent cells by that definition and others like having what we call uh, senescence associated di distension of satellite DNA and other, other things like that. Some of these cells are formally likely to be senescent, but not of a SASP and others do have a SASP. And some of the pathways that lead to the SASP have been worked out. So there are intracellular loops of various factors that can drive the SASP. DNA damage especially will drive the SASP. Different kinds of senescent cells, depending on the cell type they originated from, will differ in their SASP mm -hmm. uh, because it partly depends on what kind of cell they were before. Uh, the SASP is regulatable. So drugs like metformin and rapamycin, one of the ways they act is by down-regulating the SASP. We call them senomorphics or SASP inhibitors. Uh, and then there are things that upregulate the SASP. We recently had a paper out about coronavirus, for example, uh, where we found that uh, the coronavirus actually upregulates the SASP. Uh, so uh, that's in existing senescent cells. Right. And then senescence can spread, and it can spread both locally uh, to neighboring cells or systemically in an endocrine manner. But it depends on the kind of SASP, the kind of senescent cell, how shielded it is from the rest of the body, because senescence can cause fibrosis to occur, which can encapsulate areas where there are senescent cells, and that might reduce um, uh, spread, and also immune system ability to attack senescent cells as well. So it's complicated at the moment, um, but it, it does appear that if you, if you have small accumulations of senescent cells, at least in the transplant situation, uh, you can get spread of senescence elsewhere. But again, that depends on the host. If the host is already um, close to the threshold, uh, you know, is an older animal or individual um, who has accumulation of senescent cells or someone with BC and diabetes where there's accumulation of senescent cells, or someone who's had chemotherapy in the past, then a local accumulation of senescent cells, in our view, in our animal experiments at least, is more likely to spread than um, a similar animal that has the same local accumulation of senescent cells, but is younger and healthy. Because in that case, its immune system will likely deal with those cells. Right, so that brings me to, to one question. So before we reach this tipping point, right? Essentially, senescent cells are being cleared up by the immune system. I mean, when we're young, we have just as many senescent cells, or maybe we, we form them, um, but they well, get... You, you can form them even faster. A pregnant, you know, during pregnancy, there are a lot of senescent cells formed in the placenta, but you get rid of the placenta during, yeah. during yeah. childbirth, but there are a lot there, for example. So if you're in that kind of stage, right, you're a younger person, is there any benefit to trying to reduce your senescent burden because essentially your immune system is doing that anyway. We've found um, in younger experimental animals that are healthy, that aren't obese and haven't had other things uh, going on, that giving senolytic drugs um, doesn't seem to affect anything very much. Okay, thank you. So I, I don't know that there'd be um, uh, uh, a particular benefit of senolytics if there are no senescent cells or very few to be removed. Right, interesting, yes, that makes sense. So the other question is, so you said like 30 to 70% uh, of the senescent cells produce SASP. So in, the, in, so in cell culture and in, in preliminary in, experiments, yeah. Okay, so, so with that provides, so the other 30% or the, the, the senescent cells which are not producing SASP, um, do they have a function? Are they, will they just stay there forever or will they eventually uh, die? 
we're we're working on that. We don't, um, uh, I, you know, I, you know, we haven't had our data peer reviewed um, by by other scientists to make sure that we're on the right track. We're about to submit some work on that, but I'd 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 rather that um, colleague scientists look at our data before I make pronouncements about them. Okay. Oh, thank you. So. You did. You did mention this. Uh, so, in there were mouse trials, I believe. So, looking at the benefits of reducing senescent cell burden, right? There, there was a mouse. There were some mouse trials. Uh, can you talk about those uh, particular? I mean, what what benefits did we see from reducing, and how were the senescent cells reduced in those cases? Um, well, there are a variety of ways of targeting uh, senescent cells. One is with senolytics, and there are many, many of them now. We originally developed them based on looking for these SCAT pathways. You know, we asked why are senescent cells surviving despite the fact they kill cells around them. We found these SCAT pathways. We use what we call RNA interference. This is a way of knocking down individual nodes on those pathways to verify that those pathways are necessary for senescent cell survival. And then we uh, went back to the computer and looked for drugs that would target key nodes or, or sets of nodes on those pathways. Mm. And we found that different kinds of senescent cells depend on different sets of pathways for survival. And in some cases, they're redundant. So some senescent cell types, you've got to combine drugs uh, mm -hmm. to target them or use drugs that have multiple targets. Other kinds of senescent cells, you can go after a single target and it will kill that particular kind of senescent cell. So they, they differ with respect to how they protect themselves. So some of the better regimens are ones where, that have a broad coverage because we're going after a network in mm -hmm. many cases, not a single target. So it's no longer a one drug, one target, one disease kind of approach. Um, when um, the, the kinds of drugs that we selected for early development are ones that have short elimination half-lives. So they're removed from the body quickly because we know at least in culture, it takes a week to uh, more than a month for senescent cells to develop. So our view was we could use these drugs in a hit and run manner. They act very quickly. So a brief exposure of these uh, senescent cells to these drugs is sufficient for senescent cells to begin to kill themselves. And that becomes irreversible. So the way we give these drugs is intermittently, um, depending on whether new senescent cells are being formed, uh, you know, uh, maybe once in a lifetime in, in an animal study, or maybe repeatedly, uh, like once every two weeks or once a month or whatever, as new crops of senescent cells are developing, say in the context of high fat feeding, we <clears> would <throat> give the drugs every two weeks or thereabouts because the animals are continuing to high fat feed and that induces senescence. But if an animal's had radiation damage to a leg, for example, you just have to give the senolytic drugs for one brief course. And then um, you, know, you see whatever benefits there are persist for the remainder of the animal's life because you've killed cells that don't divide. You know, and if there's no further impetus, then you don't need to repeat it. So um, one way of killing senescent cells is with senolytics, but senolytics is not one way. There are multiple kinds of senolytics. Uh, another way is through uh, genetic targeting of uh, particular factors that tend to be up in senescent cells. But as I mentioned before, there's nothing that's completely sensitive and specific for detecting senescent cells. And that includes P16 and P21, which are targets that people have used to clear senescent cells genetically. The trouble is not every senescent cell has an increase in P16 and not every cell that has high P16 is senescent. So some activated mm -hmm. immune cells like macrophages have high P16. So in the genetic experiments, you don't always know that you're just killing senescent cells and if you're killing all of them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same with senolytics. With senolytics will only kill the senescent cells that have a SASP. They will not kill the other senescent cells that don't have a SASP. And the different senolytics will kill different sets of senescent cells. So depending on how you um, do the experiments, you'll see different results. So we always do the converse experiments, which is transplanting senescent cells to try to fulfill Koch's postulates. You know, if you um, take away bacteria in Koch's postulates, you uh, reduce pneumonia. If you give um, uh, the bacteria to an individual, you'll cause pneumonia. So we like to do that. We like to think of developing senolytics in the same way as you develop antibiotics. We're killing a bad cell type. Once it's gone, it's gone. At least in the case of senescent cells, they tend not to divide. 
but in our experiments, what we normally do is we add back senescent cells and see if we cause a problem in a young animal. And then we do the converse in an old animal. If we feel the problems related to senescent cells, then we remove the senescent cells and see if the problem gets better. And then we've got an idea of, of whether there's causality of, of causation or not. Mm. And so it, it's, it's, it's a long series of experiments you have to do to convince yourself that um, you know, um, a particular uh, disease state is related to senescence and that clearing senescent cells will benefit it. Right. And what kind of benefits have you seen from removing senescent cells? Well, in a variety of animal models of different diseases, and none of them are really perfect, we see alleviation of multiple uh, conditions. As you'd expect uh, from Gordon Lithgow's gerocytes hypothesis, mm. that these fundamental aging processes of which senescence is one, uh, and that they're all are interlinked by the unitary hypothesis, you'd, you'd expect that multiple conditions where age is the biggest risk factor might be alleviated. For example, mm. your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease um, is, you know, uh, the, the, the risk is 80% or more dependent on your age. Your risk of getting a heart attack, stroke, or, uh, you know, other, other problems with uh, blood clots is increased two to fourfold if you have a positive family history, a high cholesterol, a high blood sugar, uh, um, high blood pressure. But if you're 80 as opposed to 30, your, your risk is increased a thousandfold. You know, so these fundamental aging processes appear to be root cause contributors. So we would anticipate that anything that targets a fundamental aging process should affect multiple of these things. And that's been shown now with senolytics. It's been shown with metformin. It's been shown with rapamycin related drugs. It's been shown with sirtuin agonists. It's been shown with uh, NAD precursors that there isn't just one condition, at least in experimental animals, there are multiple conditions where uh, these agents either delay um, uh, prevent, or in some cases, alleviate or even treat uh, these kinds of conditions that are, that are related to fundamental aging processes. So the things range from diabetes to dementia, to frailty, to um, uh, osteoporosis, to osteoarthritis, which we mentioned before, to uh, uh, results of having had cancer treatment, to transplantation situations, uh, to um, outcomes from infections like coronavirus. Um, you know, old, old mice, if you infect them with a relative of human coronavirus, they die much more quickly than young mice. Mm. You know, they, they're all dead within 12 days in this particular experiment, and the young mice don't die. But if we treat the old mice with senolytics or we remove senescent cells genetically, we um, greatly reduce the death of the old mice. Interesting, yes. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well, and we'll speak to you again soon.